Hello, hello, and welcome to part two of this week's Lawrence Plays Factorio Space Exploration and Crastorio 2 update, where I shall probably not be talking about a great deal of the stuff that I've been doing, because I covered all of that in the last video where I was talking all about Agnea, and so this time hopefully I'll manage not to at all. And so I'm going to start off today by uh, looking at this this blank area of um, space scaffolding here, which is relevant because this is where there used to be a ship that went out to Talos. And it's no longer there, as you can clearly see, the, the ship doesn't land here anymore because we replaced it quite a long time ago with this ship over here, which has its own landing spot and all, all of the infrastructure around it. And the one that was left over here was now old, an old design and um, was, wasn't really doing anything. And so Mark went in and he tidied it up, so he's demolished the ship, he's got rid of all of the resources and put them hopefully put them all into the appropriate places and not just dump them all into warehouses but who knows hopefully it's all gone the right way and now we can reuse this space for something else and Mark has already sort of started doing that to an extent so down here he's tidied this area up a bit and this is where all of the bits and pieces that are required on other planets are brought up to then be taken out and put into the spaceships uh, that is with the exception of the well the, the Vulcanite comes in from the from the Agnea ship and is provided from there and the Sulphur comes in from the Taras ship and is provided from there but other than that the uh, um, the, the other things that come in, like the uh, the rare metals which we're flowing through at the moment to be put onto the ship out to Kothar, and all of the little bits and pieces that are needed by pretty much every planet in order to keep the elevators and the trains and the meteor defences and the um, pollution defences running, those are all brought out separately over here by the by this system. Mark has also added in a supply of glass here, and this is I think I believe this is needed for Big Rid, and it is being loaded into the Big Rid um, dock at the moment. And this is because to make one of the later Vita Melange products, I think think it's the epoxy or it might be the I'm not sure one of the ones in the little bottle anyway uh, so probably the reagent requires quite a lot of glass to make those bottles and so that's all being provided over here by the uh, by the glass supply that's being brought up from the ground um, in, in, in a train exactly as you'd expect as part of this the connection through to the uh, the transmitter and receiver that go down to the planet were unfortunately broken and I believe that's because they were connected through the uh, Talos station and, and, and then the transmitter and receiver were over here so they've been relocated reapplied rebuilt and, and so on and these these signals bring up uh, are very very important uh, one of them the receiver up here gets the signals down from the ground that says hey we would like some iridium or some holmium or some beryllium so a train can go down with that resource and it also transmits down the signals of all of the different useful resources we have stockpiled up here so that when we look at the chart over here we can see what resources we've got and at the moment we seem to have lots and lots of cryonite and we have lots and lots of beryllium but we don't have any of any of the other ones. Now the ship, the spaceship, as I discussed yesterday, the spaceship for the Vulcanite has just started flying again because of Tristan's um, efforts in clearing out all of the junk that was building up and, and, and preventing it from flying. So that had just arrived, I think, when we when we uh, left orbit just now. But it's obviously being used up as quickly as it's being brought in at the moment. So, but eventually, I'm 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 optimistic that after the ship has gone back and forth a couple of times, we'll have a decent amount of Vulcanite showing here. But that's something to keep an eye on. The holmium and the iridium, well, those are um, those are those are still struggling. But again, um, the iridium is now flowing again thanks to the enriched vulcanite supply that has been resupplied, and so that will hopefully get us a spaceship relatively soon. Um, the problem is we're getting through enormous quantities of the iridium, but at least it's it's a start, I suppose. We will have to keep an eye on it and and just try and scrape it, scrape enough of it together to keep the science running at the rate we want it to. Otherwise, on the graph. I was going to say things seem to be mostly okay, but we appear to have... Oh, uh, that, that's, that's a separate. That's one to be copied and pasted, I think. It's not actually feeding the numbers in. Uh, we seem to have a shortage of iron ingots, which is a worry, and a shortage of steel plates. I wonder if that's actually true. It is not true, at least for the iron ingots. The iron ingots are not connected into the green network, so there should be a cable like this green cable comes out here and then goes into one of these pylons. Uh, so in order to fix that, we would need to have a green cable coming from here. Bomb, 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 bomb. There we go, that should that should fix that problem. And then exactly the same for the steel plates down here. And so now when we look at the graph again, we can see that we ha suddenly have some iron ingots and some steel plates. It doesn't seem to be all that much of them actually, which is a little bit um, odd, because given that those where those storage areas seem to be full, we've got the full 25,000 ingots and 47,000 steel plates. So I think that just means these uh, these numbers in, in, in these in these divisors along here are wrong. And you all know exactly how these graphs work, of course, because you'll have watched my, um, uh, my videos on, on, on how to make your own. There we go. Full, well, uh, yes, full full bars now for these two. Um, <laughs> I, I'm not sure if those are the correct numbers. We'll let someone else work that out. The next place I want to have a look at is Taras, and Mark has done some work out here, improving the uh, the supply of various resources from here. So tar the whole the point of Taras is that it produces the imosite crystals and the immersium plates, and those are 
those are coming through at a at a rate that doesn't look too bad um, but it is quite notable if we, if we have a look in this warehouse okay it's not very full yet but if I sort it you can see there's a lot of sand in here already and if you look at these belts you can see there's a lot of sand on these and there's a lot of sand pouring in this is what I was talking about yesterday when I was saying just how much sand the emesite production uh, causes um, now the train is whipping around nice and quickly here, so we're getting the rare metals brought down, we're getting the uh, resources passed up, so the, the, I mean things things are working nicely here, the throughput is pretty good, but that is a crazy crazy amount of sand. Now the reason I've come over here to show you this isn't because we, isn't just to say oh look at all this sand we've got, the main reason is to say that um, this system that Mark set up a little while ago, which I think I might have glanced at but not really talked about, where we're producing, um, I think this is just making, yes, this is just making the immersion plates from uh, raw emersite flowing in the bottom here, this has now been turned on and it's okay it's not working at full speed as you can see we've only got one of the three belts with any input but this is now churning out a nice supply of, um, of, of extra immersion plate across here to be added into what's being produced over here so we've now got a, li a, li a little bit more coming through and that's a really good thing because all of our um, production at the moment seems to get through massive quantities of immersion plate it, it seems to be that it's the it's the high tier ingredient that's required for all of the more advanced machines and things. So it's needed for beams that go into some of the more advanced machines like that, it's needed for uh, gears which go into advanced machines and advanced tech cards as well, so that's another another place it's sinking. Uh, the impulse rather the tank, superior inserters, you can see what I mean. There's a lot of stuff in here that takes all of the, that takes a large quantities of the immersion plates. We need a lot of that coming through, and that is something we're now we're able to bring make make quite a bit more of it thanks to that improvement. Um, we've got two nice solid belts of the um, are these. I, I was going to say are these core chunks? No, I think these are. I think this is just raw immersite. And most of it is being produced from core chunks. So over here, you can see the first step here is, is pulverizing. We're pulverizing core uh, immersite core chunks, and then and then processing the immersite afterwards. And I think down here, yes, we've got the same thing going on down here. We've got the immersite, immersite core chunks coming in and then being processed out. So we do have a small immersite mine up here running. So this is producing just straight up immersite, although one of the drills has run out already. Um, but most of the places where we're getting immersite from, we've gone more for the core mining because I'm aware that these patches tend to... Oh no, there's a second one running up here. But these patches tend not to have an absolutely enormous amount in them. Now we are looking at close to a million in, in several of these, so maybe maybe actually I'm being a little bit unfair. Maybe they can produce quite a lot more than I realised, but I think I'm more comfortable with us generally using the uh, the core mines. And this is quite a big planet that we seem to have explored all of, and it's got some purple mountains down here, lovely. Lots and lots of core patches, but there's also quite a lot of water, so it's going to be a bit of a faff getting out to them. I noticed that because this, because this, this is a planet that Mark has been doing, everything's done by uh, ridiculously long belts, um, I guess that's okay, but maybe in the future, maybe we'll want to put in a train system for some of the even more distant ones. Um, we'll we'll see. We'll see when we when we start to require power and and how how it goes. Ha. Mark has said that he wished he had file available because uh, that would make it a lot easier to make the bridges across the water with 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 trains. So um, yeah, maybe um, may, maybe he will go out and expand out by by train at some point because getting out to here by. <sighs> Oh, I don't know. There's some awkward areas of sea, basically, and a lot of the a lot of the emersite patches seem to be on other islands and things like that. So this is this is going to be a difficult planet to expand on. Notably, we've had a couple of firsts on this planet. This is the first planet in the in the entire system to have multiple trains. There's one there at the moment, and if we look up at the opposite end, there's one here unloading. So at the moment, the idea is you can have one on its way, one unloading while the other one's loading. So this should double the amount of stuff that can be brought through. And because he's doubled the amount of stuff that can be brought through, he's also added in a second spaceship. So again, first planet to get a second spaceship, which I can see absolutely no evidence of, but I'm going to take his word for it that it's out there somewhere. Uh, presumably, it's currently land currently um, stopped in, in, in orbit or something like that. And the reason we need quite so much throughput is down to that sheer quantity of sand I was talking about earlier. So if we have a look at one of the, if we have a look in this spaceship, um, you can see that in, in, in the warehouse here, we've got, actually I was going to say, it's not that much sand, but the uh, the stuff that we actually want, the immersite crystals and the immersion plates, are only taking up about, I would eyeball that to be about, maybe if slightly more than a third of the of the space in the spaceship whereas on other planets it tends to be sort of 
70, 80 percent of the thing of the uh, of the uh, exotic material that you're trying to bring back to, in the uh, in in the ship. So here we're getting so much sulfur and so much sand that in order to get a decent flow of the immersium coming through or the immersite in the immersium, we need to have more logistical capacity to take all of the byproducts as well because there's there's not a lot else to do with them. We could potentially turn turn all of this sand into glass on Taras, but at least if we ship it over to Norvis first, then we can make the decision after it's been transported uh, rather than having a load of glass turn up when we actually really really wanted silicon. At the other end of this link, Mark has put in a cut these, these two strong boxes here, and these are there to provide a little bit of extra buffering for the um, for the immersium gear, uh, plates and for the emersite crystals. Uh, the idea being that they're not going to be included in the, in the count, and therefore we're going to have more of it brought over, I think. I don't think this has been turned into a uh, into a, a sushi county system yet. The idea being that we'll have an extra supply in these two that can then be passed through to here when a train comes and needs lots of it. Because at the moment we only have a little bit of we only have plates available and not very much of that. Now, granted, a, a ship has just arrived with a load of both and it's trying to unload as fast as it can. Um, but there is still a bit of a shortage over here. You can also see the problem we're running through with the sheer amount of sulphur that's being produced here. So we've got eleven thousand in here at the moment, and um, and we're supposed to be outputting it when there's five thousand in here and. So we are chucking the uh, the sulphur out as fast as we can into this disposal system up here, which means that's all getting taken down to the ground. And we seem to have run out of um, run out of fuel here. Uh, there seem to be yes, there's a couple of inserters missing up here, which should be to putting in taking out the dead batteries and putting in the live ones. Um, and that hasn't happened. And this train has therefore run out of batteries. I mean that that's a bit weird. I'm I'm surprised by that. But it's something that's going to need to be fixed fairly soon anyway. But as I was trying to say, yes, the the sulfur we have so much sulfur being produced from here that these but this buffer is completely filled up, and we don't know we don't have anything else to do with it down here, so it's just sort of stock being stockpiled here. Now I would like to start passing it over to the um, Agnea ship, but some thought is going to be required on how much of it we're going to take over, um, and how we're going to make sure that the ship arrives and departs properly when there's an unknown, an arbitrary unknown amount of extra stuff being put into it as well. So some some care is going to be required here, but I think we should be able to ship it over to Agnea and start making it into Vulcanite. One of the problems we keep running into in this game is that whenever anything gets dumped out of someone's inventory or an area gets demolished by the robots or something like that, lots of the um, lots of the bits, lots of the stuff from that area gets gathered up by the robots and then dropped off in any yellow chest they can find. And then sort of, in this particular case, it rattles down through all the way down here to the bottom, and we ends up in what we tend to what we affectionately refer to as the warehouses of shame. And there are there are different types of shame in these warehouses. So sometimes the, the the shame is that we accidentally ordered too many warehouses somehow. So we've got many hundreds of warehouses taking up loads of space. We've got an excessive number of red belts here as well, for example. Let's sort this uh, warehouse so we can see. Yeah, an excessive number of red belts. We've got an excessive number of tanks. There's just too much of lots of different things. Why there's so many white inserters here, I, I, I have no idea. But at least these sort of things will get gathered up and in theory they will get used by the rest of the factory. So when we build out an expansion somewhere, maybe it'll use up some, some filter inserters and they'll be taken from here. Or maybe we'll use a load of belts up on it uh, when we go out to an outpost and they'll be pulled from here. So in theory these numbers should go, these, this, this stuff should get taken away and reused somewhere else eventually. The second type is again not quite so shameful, but it's stuff that shouldn't really be here. Like all these all these uh, greenhouses for example, now, now in theory we could technically perhaps use them somewhere all these gas power stations we could but we're not going to these are these have all come from free power systems why they're up here in orbit i'm not really sure but these in theory need to be gathered up taken away and probably recycled for for, for uh, scrap because we're not going to actually use them again but again at least these are machines that in theory could be picked up and used for construction somewhere the real shame is stuff like this beryllium plate holmium plate uh, iron sticks cables and so on all these sort of things that are resources that should be off in a building somewhere in the factory, being turned into something later on. This uranium ore should be in the it should be in the um, in the recycling system, being taken down to Norvist and processed into into useful uranium. Um, However, uh, it's, it's, all, it's all sort of built up in here, and over, and over in this warehouse we've got an enormous quantity of aeroframe bulkheads, we've got a mirror, we've got some copper cables, all these sort of things. They're all resources that should be off somewhere else, and these batteries as well. There's lots of things that shouldn't be in here, should be off in, in a more appropriate place, being, being used for construction. 
Um, and so every so often, someone will come round and tidy them, tidy them up a bit, take things off to where they belong. And the worst offenders are the, uh, are the any of these data cards. And so Tristan has put down some some uh, blue chests around the uh, around the factory and in uh, strategic places that will pull unwanted stuff out of the uh, system. So for example, if there are any science packs in the in the uh, in the logistics system, they should get pulled out here. He's put all of the ones we've got so far. Well, actually, he hasn't put in the data cards, but he's put in all of the actual science packs into the uh, in, in, into this re the request on this logistics chest here. So this will pull any of them out if they, that, ha that happen to find their way into the system. And similarly over here, he's done the same sort of thing for all of the for the various data cards that are required for making the uh, the astro sciences. So there's the four that go in here. There's there's that's the gravitational lensing data we saw before. So in theory, because that's there, you can see that one's not red. That's not got a red um, background on it. It's not been redded out. And so that means there is some somewhere in there's 18 of them in logistics storage apparently. And so as the machine over here runs, those will be brought over to here. They'll be dumped into this machine instead of taking them from here, and that'll pull them out of circulation. And there's another one down here that's pulling in uh, negative pressure data and there's still, there's still 54 of those somewhere in storage as well. So this is tidying up a lot of the things that are around that shouldn't be and down here we've got the, all the ones that are for um, Astro 4. So this should pull out all of those sort of resources. In theory some of the some of the stuff I saw um, Oh, when I criticise <laughs> when I criticise the bulk, the aeroframe bulkheads here, no, these these are actually supposed to be here. That's the one one area where they are actually supposed to be. But uh, some yeah, a lot of the other stuff shouldn't be. Some of the other things that we might be able to pull out and put back into the t into the top up here. I but I suspect that all of the stuff that's ended up down here isn't really is 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 now in the wrong place. So for example, the superconductive cables and the copper cables that we we're seeing here, those aren't needed on the bus here. So those would need to be taken away by probably by hand and dropped into appropriate machines. Or we could carry on with what Tristan's been doing. We could put in, for example, for the copper cables, we could put in a blue chest up here and have it push the copper cables into this assembly machine and then they get turned into pipes which would be used around around the rest of the factory. So that would pull them out, it would get them into a place where they could be used. It's sort of almost a one at a time. Now, if going in and doing the science stuff, that meant each of the data cards was a four at a time and the science was all of the sciences, so that was relatively easy. The rest of it, it's a case of looking at it and going, yeah, okay, actually we, we need to move a few of those over there, a few of those to here, and they're all completely different. So it's a little bit more awkward. Sometimes it feels like it's a lot easier just to go over to the warehouses, grab out all of the things that shouldn't be in them, and then just fly up and down the bus hammering on the even distribution buttons so, so they get scattered into the into all the machines you're flying over. I did a little bit of the same sort of thing over on Agnea because we've got these we've got these various warehouses. So I've, I've taken I've taken out some of the ores and passed them over to the uh, the train systems. But more uh, more importantly, when as I was ripping everything up over here, huge amounts of things like enriched vulcanite were ending up in the warehouses. So I came over here a few times, grabbed an inv inventory load of it flew over and dumped it into all of the all of the systems over here and I believe that's what's caused some of these particularly spectacular spikes along here I don't think the system is capable of producing quite that much but if you fly over and dump a huge amount of the hardest ingredients to obtain into back into the systems then they go oh suddenly I've got loads to play with and you get this brief spike of productivity out of the system um, as it is this around here seems to be the normal amount it can produce down on Norvis, Tristan has added in an extra cryonite drop-off station here, which has got 94 uh, stacks of, of cryonite in, which is a pretty good number. So that probably means the station is deactivated, and we'll uh, call, and we'll call a train over when it's uh, when it's when it's ready for a bit more. Uh, yes, it is, and that means that this can be fed up the uh, up the belts along here, across here, and here, and here, and in here, and then this is being fed into one of the uh, the trains over here which allows it to be brought up and supplied to the um, energy science here. So apparently we, were, we didn't have any coming in here. Everything we've been doing for the last however long with the cryonite has just been relying on whatever was dropped in into a delivery cannon chest. And now that we've stopped using delivery cannons as much as we re reasonably can at this point, uh, we've had to start bringing it up here. And, and apparently that got forgotten, but that's a good thing because there's lots of systems along here that use that. And in order to make sure that, that keeps working, Tristan has put in some additional core mines out here on Snowdrop. I'm going to guess it's the ones that are furthest away, so probably these ones down here. Um, and he's got various belts, as you can see, bringing all of that resource back up here to be t to be turned into the cryonite. And so there's presumably a fairly heavy, a fairly healthy supply of cryonite coming through. Yeah, you can see here we've got two belts that are decently full, actually. That's a lot. That's a lot of cryonite coming through there, and, and then being fed into the trains and yada yada yada. You've seen all this before. Um, he's also improved the junk disposal, which probably means he's put it. That's probably why there's two belts here instead of one, because uh, presumably that wasn't keeping up either. And he's also noted that uh, more cryonite is needed out on Njord, so it's a good thing that this has been um, improved and sped up and generally made more so because we're yeah we're getting through, we're getting through quite a lot of cryonite. But as you saw when we looked at the graph, this cryonite does seem to be one of the few things. Uh, that we actually have a decent supply of at the moment. So, uh, so yeah, that's going well. 
The iron mine trains have been sorted out by Tristan as well. He's um, he's got what he found. One of them was uh, stuck in a station, waiting for a full load that was never going to happen. That's probably because we were trying to empty a uh, em empty out a completely dead mine. I've no idea where that was. There'll be a dead iron mine somewhere around, unless he tidied it up as well at the same time, which is, to be honest, quite possible. Um, there's one over here that hasn't been built and finished, um, <laughs> and probably never will be now that we've got the uh, supply coming in from Ollie Ran. But he did also allow more space in the iron train stacker, wherever that is. And it's um, not this one here, the, the one where the, the mine trains go to after they've left the station. And I, I, I don't know where that is, but there is somewhere, somewhere that keeps trains after they've left this station, when they're on their way out to a mine, just in case there aren't any mines that have enough supply available for a train to go to them. Uh, so that's very much required, otherwise you end up with the train just sitting here, not leaving, and all of these ones with high priority um, iron ore supplies available, not being able to get into the station. And the, and the entire system just jamming up, so it's a good thing. To, it's a good thing to have that working. Up top side in Norbit, Mark has started making the uh, construction pylons over here. So a construction pylon is made from a normal pylon and some various bits and pieces that go in there. And the point of these things is they are pylons that also provide roboport connections, I believe. Let's try putting a couple of these down just to see what they, see what they look like. So these provide power to a very small area, like like the nor like a non substation pylon. Fine. Um, they also, I think they also. This it says a 64 by 64 construction area. We'll find out in a second when these uh, robots come up to uh, to place them. Yes. Okay. So we get full construction. Co we'll get 64 tile construction coverage. So you can use it for that. Um, but Mark was saying there was something about them that he didn't like, and therefore was having to go back to something else. I'm not sure. I'm not sure exactly what that was. So it looks like they can't realistically be used for extending your construction range because they don't have suitable um, coverage in order to build the next one out there. Maybe you, maybe you'd end up having to put one in the middle or something like that. Would that be manageable? Yeah, that's just about manageable. And so if that gets placed there, then you could then go through and deconstruct half of them afterwards. I suppose it feels like a not the not a great way of um, extending your factory. Um, they also don't seem to provide power either, so I'm not sure I see the point in these. Things. It does provide power, but it's slightly weirder. So we could now I could now come in and remove this one because it's not needed in the middle. We'll still get the full um, full Roboport construction coverage like that, um, and the power coverage or the power transmission, not coverage. I don't know. I yeah, I'm not I'm not sure I see, really see the point in these. They also don't appear to charge robots up, so you're not really going to be able to use them to extend the Roboport range too far. Yeah, they they don't seem all that useful. Um, maybe we'll change our minds later. Maybe there's a, an, an upgrade, a further upgraded version of it that's even better. Like this one, the con oh, that is the construction pylon. I don't know. They don't seem that great. I think we'll probably just stick with a combination of pylon substations and the various types of roboports. So those ones we have. I noticed we now have roboports, small roboports, large roboports, and superchargers. We'll play around with those at some point. But to be honest, I think most of the time I don't. I don't see these actually being all that useful. They have a longer range than the large pylons, but then I don't. But they have, I think they have the same range as the as the uh, pylon substations, and the pylon substations seem to be much more effective and useful. Yeah, I'm. I'm not sure I see the point of these, but maybe we'll change our mind on that later. Mike has put in an emergency system over here. So this is the main Norvis to Norbit space elevator. And it's very, very important. It's the backbone of our entire system, our entire uh, logistics system between the, two, between the two areas. And there's a very, very small risk of there being a problem with the supply of elevator cables down on Norvis. So at the moment, this is supplied with elevator cables that buy this belt here, and they're being fed in. They're made on the planet. They're being brought. There's lots of them available. They're being brought through, and that's maintaining the elevator because they gradually get through these cable pieces as, as they wear out, and you need to keep up a steady supply. Uh, and so there's always a risk of, of the if, if the supply dies down here for some reason, perhaps because we run out of one of the exotic materials that goes into it, because there's been problems somewhere else in the factory. Uh, we could, in theory, have a point get to a point where this elevator cable breaks and we can no longer use it. If that happens, as I say, it, 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 we would no longer be able to get any of the exotic materials back down to the bottom in order to, you know, in order to fix the problem. So we could be in a very, very awkward position. And so we now have a couple of chests up here with enough cable in them to completely rebuild this elevator from scratch if it's necessary, and that will allow us to get it running and get and then bring down an emergency train of whatever it is that we've run out of in order to kick kickstart things again and get the get the system flowing. We would have to babysit it very carefully 
but that's still a lot better than the whole thing just being broken. So yeah, that's going to be very, very useful, very, very valuable. I've added an extra stream of uh, belts here, taking up the beryllium poles and the beryllium bulkheads because to the uh, to the system, to the tower of construction. Because previously we were making the poles in here, which we don't want to do because that's bad and inefficient and so on. We'd rather make them down on the planet where we can use the productivity modules and, and save a certain amount of beryllium and the immerse and anything else that goes into it. And I've done the same with the bulkheads. Now these are, they were being made up here. As you can see, we've still got the various belts in that we're bringing some of, some of the ingredients in, but we're not actually loading this machine up anymore. So, we, so we'll, what we, we're trying to run through what it's got in its, in its internal inventory, which actually we have done now. We can rip this up and, and, and pass those back into circulation. Um, and then we've got this chest here that needs, needs to very, very gradually empty. But once it does, all the bulkheads will then flow up this belt here, will be brought in this way and supplied to everything that needs them from, uh, from again, from the ground where they're being made with productivity modules. So that's much more efficient. It is, as I said, time to get rid of that now. Uh, it's no longer needed, but that will dump a certain amount of stuff back into the chest of shame and yada, 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 but oh well. Getting this in, in to start working did mean that down here I had to put an extra warehouse onto the bottom of the space bus. So now we've got, I've moved, I've shuffled all these down. Well, I've added in an extra one on the end here and with the with the hope that everything that was in, in the, um, the, this one would then be passed down and there'd be room for it all down here. Now we've got so much belt and pipe and other miscellaneous junk in here that that hasn't been the case and this is going to be problematic if we ever need any more of this. Maybe I need to put in another warehouse over here or something, I, I don't know, it's, it's all kind of horrible. Um, but at least this means we can now get the uh, aeroframe bulkheads onto the bus so down here and that means they can be passed up and into the uh, into the tower of construction over there. Finally I've done some expansion in the matter science area so there's a few extra um, uh, material fabricators in the in, in the columns down here. Um, a little bit more speed up along here and uh, now it's all ground to a halt because we've run out of one of the uh, mater uh, material sciences. So this, this, this one? Yes, this one. We've run out of fire data down here, but I don't know why this one's not working. This one's not got any particle stream because I haven't linked the pipes across the top here. Yeah, okay, so I need to get the particle stream into here somehow. It's a bit of a mess at the moment, but I, I forgot about it because it's all hidden behind the top of the machine here. So I, um, yeah, I, I, I didn't realise that that wasn't going to be fed in properly. So that needs, that's going to need to be sorted out. Uh, I'll do that at some point, but not right now. And so that brings us on to the uh, researches that we've done. We've done the research to advanced roboports, which has got us the small roboport and the large roboport. This is getting very, uh, very Goldilocks. And these can be compared to the normal roboport, which has a supply area of 50 by 50 and a construction area of 110 by 110 and can charge four robots. These ones, we have a uh, supply area that's a bit smaller, 36 and, and 68, uh, but it can recharge eight robots and significantly faster. So these are going to be these are going to be really good for dropping in in places where you want to charge your robots up a bit more quickly. Although there is also a supercharger that does a similar thing, and I think for larger numbers of robots, uh, probably one of those came from space exploration, the other came from K2. <laughs> then we have the large roboport, which does a supply area of 200 by 200 and a construction area of 400 by 400. That's amazing. Yeah, we definitely need to start using those just everywhere because it'll make it'll make putting down a roboport network so much easier. Uh, and it recharges robots 20 at a time, five times faster than a normal roboport. So yeah, this is, this is absolutely fantastic. However, if you look at the uh, stuff you need to make it, it's heavy composites, which are an iridium thing, aeroframe scaffolds, which is beryllium. You need immersium in two different ways. You need, AI, you need AI cores, which we haven't even started making yet, although somebody was thinking about looking at those, and a normal roboport and steel and rare metals. Those are all relatively easy, but there's so much exotic stuff going that needs to go in there that maybe, well, we, we'll, we'll see. Once we've got them being made, in reasonably large numbers, then maybe we'll stop caring about how much, how awkward they are to make, and we'll just start chucking them out everywhere. But getting all of those things together in the first place is going to be a bit of a mission. We have developed the Mark III mining drill, and this uses dynamic emitters and various ir ir iridium and immersium um, bits and pieces, and a big mining drill, to make a drill that presumably is significantly faster. Uh, so it's 1.2 per second and 9 by 9. A basic drill is half per second and 5 by 5. And the Mark II is uh, 0.75 per second and 7x7. Seven seven. So it's, yeah, it's quite, it's actually more, it's more faster than the two, than the two is time, than, than the one, if that makes sense. Um, although perhaps as a proportionally, it's, it's fairly similar. Um, it's also that little bit bigger as well. So yeah, I think this would be a useful one to upgrade to. 
It'd be very, ni it'd be very nice to have have start using the uh, the Mark III drills. I think because they're going to they're going to be have, have, pull this pull stuff out of the ground a lot faster and for over a larger area. And so we're going to get a lot more out of any mine that we upgrade to these these ones. So any of our mines where we feel like the mining is the uh, limiting factor would be good good um, candidates for being upgraded to Mark III's. And I think the Vulcanite ones might uh, might fit that um, description. We have developed superior robot batteries, and this sounds really exciting. Actually, this is this is a puts it gives you a sixty percent buff on your um, on your worker robot battery capacity, meaning they can presumably fly sixty percent further before they have to recharge. And since one of the big problems with the uh, construction robots is they spend half their time turning around and going back because they're running low on power, uh, having this having this boost would be extremely useful. So apparently we we have already done better battery uh, research, which gave us a forty percent buff. Um, I don't know whether these are whether this is a sixty percent in total, or I think I think it probably adds an extra sixty percent on on top of the forty percent. They're now going to have about twice the battery capacity that they did uh, originally. So that's yeah, that's going to be pretty nice. So I think we'll uh, it should make the robots a little bit better. And if we add if we can add in a few speed buffs as well, then that'd be great. We've developed the uh, the tier three no tier four uh, lab because we started off with a basic normal little little blue greenhouse thing on on Norvis. Then we moved up. Then there was an advanced one of those, I think. Uh, that, we, that was sort of, it felt like it was intended for you to use it for the uh, the first few space sciences, the production and the utility science packs that you make it when you first get to space. Then there's the uh, space science labs, the big dome things that are, uh, that do all of the sort of the tiers of sciences. And now we've got the singularity lab. And apparently this comes with a significant buff to um, research productivity. And so that's going to allow us to have so that might make our research a bit more efficient, I'm not quite sure. But this is another thing that's going to require AI cores and, and lots of other complicated things. So this is going to be a bit of a mission to make, but when we do, I suspect it's going to be very, very nice, very, very useful. And we've got tier 4 laser defences, both uh, sniper and, and submachine. That's great. I mean, they're they're better, better late, but better personal lasers, and these will probably come in extremely useful later on in the game when we start trying to clear out pyramids. Uh, for now, not such a big deal because we're not really going into the pyramids at the moment because they're scary, or at least the one on um, Agnaris. I don't know why everyone else, what everyone else's excuses are, <laughs> um, but they are. Yep, they're uh, available now. And we've done a little bit of robot speed buffing, boosting as well. We've done 10 and a little bit of 11, so that'll, that'll make our robots go faster. And that's it. So that brings us to the end. So thank you, uh, thank you again for watching. We, uh, I think things are going quite well over here. We, we, we are beefing up a lot of the supplies, as, as you've seen. So getting to the point where, where we can now think about going on and doing the next science packs, the next uh, big out, big pushes to go off and get new things like, uh, like Naquium. And so come along on Thursday to watch us making some progress on that. Come along on Tuesday when I should be playing some uh, Satisfactory, so a completely different factory game uh, with some weird 3D stuff that I'm not sure I fully understand, but we'll see how that goes. And of course, come back next weekend uh, for the usual update videos. So, as ever, thank you very much for watching, and I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.